Uh, welcome back to another episode of Afghan Beyond Conflict. This series will be running throughout the month of February on Wednesdays and Saturdays, where we'll delve into the evolution of Afghan identity with our esteemed guests. To receive notifications and updates regarding the series, please follow our social media platforms. And if you miss any of our episodes, please check them out on our YouTube channel. Today, we'll be in conversation with Garanji Gaba. Garanji is an Afghan Sikh refugee who migrated to the UK 14 years ago. He has been modeling since 2016 and has been a filmmaker since 2012. Garanji has, has been published in magazines such as Vogue Runway, Vogue, uh, GQ Online and GQ India. Karanji, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Now, the first question that we ask all of our speakers um, when they come on is, what does it mean to you to be personally Afghan? Um, well, it's like I'm representing not just a minority, I'm rep representing the whole nation. So it's a very proud feeling where whenever you hear something about Afghanistan, it's always relatable to bombing or terrorism but it has a lot of other stories and other things as well as just terrorism itself. And I think there's a lot to explore in that specific media and uh, the medium itself. So for me, it's quite a proud feeling that come from such a background where people have been still evolving and still starting to come out from the shelves, but still being pushed out there. So it's still a proud feeling to say that I'm, I'm, I'm an Afghan. I can imagine, uh, you know, with such a great heritage that uh, the Afghans have. Um, now, you belong to a particular group of Afghans, the Afghan Sikhs. Um, it's not something that I would say a lot of people know about. I do think that it doesn't get enough coverage as much as it deserves. Uh, I honestly personally heard about Afghan Sikhs when I heard about um, refugees coming into the UK in a big truckload. And, you know, the um, and they were, you know, basically mistreated along the way. And then it turned out they were Afghan Sikhs. So, um, you know, could you tell us more about that identity and what it means to you and how has it influenced your upbringing? So for me personally, I was very little. So I was about nine when I, um, I left the country and I came to this country. Well, I was living in Afghanistan, so I had to go through a lot of racism as well. And there, will be, there were some conflicts which I faced, but I'm not going to say I faced it entirely. I, I faced the racism over here as well. But I still had that connection because I was born in that particular area. People used to wear the same clothes as me. So I still had that home feeling. But at the same time, I wasn't, I didn't fit in with the, with, with the people because I had a whole total different religion. And um, on the journey when I came to, um, to London, to be fair, I was, again, very little. I had, I've, I've got very small glimpses. All I remember is waking up in a different truck and then coming to a UK within a whole different field. Like, obviously, that's something my parents probably be able to tell more in depth. But for me personally, it was, um, you know how you see in movies is like a montage, like a, a film of real where you see a person going into one door and coming up from a different door. That was basically me when I left Afghanistan. Um, and when I came to um, UK, I was still a kid. I did not know what was going on. I was still trying to learn the language. Uh, whereas in Afghanistan, the only language which I personally um, spoke of was Hindko. And that's something, again, recently I found out that I used to speak Hindko. <laughs> uh, so that was the only language which I knew of. When I used to go to the Gurdwara, the, the language which people mostly were speaking was um, in Punjabi or mm -hmm. Hindko. And uh, also the Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the Holy Scripture, which we read at home, is written in uh, Punjabi as well. So that was the only mother tongue, the only tongue which I knew. And... Um, and when I came to UK, it was a whole total different perspective because everyone used to speak English. The way they used to dress was whole, totally different. Um, the way they used to do things was totally different. So it took me quite a while to kind of fit in with them. Um, so it was quite difficult. So I, when I first came into the UK, I used to live in Liverpool. Then I moved down to Wolverhampton, then to Birmingham, then came to London. So... 
I've been living in different areas, trying to learn different languages, even different dialects and accents. So it's mm -hmm. quite a journey to explore. And I can say that everywhere you go, every person is different. Every person's story is different. And every province that you live in is different. So it's all always about learning and speaking to people and just getting to know them. And that's how I came to find out who really I am by speaking to my elderly my parents and people who've been always throughout their journey who have been coming from Afghanistan and have made over here. So speaking to them, I found out more about myself because I was very little when I came here and I don't know what I've, you know, when you're little, when you're, when yeah. you're a kid, you don't really know much about yourself. So I get to know more about myself when I actually came to the UK. So yeah, it's been a very long journey where I've come from and who I am today. No, I can imagine. Now I've seen your, um, you know, especially on your social medias where you've been speaking out against, you know, the atrocities that are happen happening in back home for you, you know, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What motivates you, you know, even though you've been brought up here, uh, you know, what motivates you to stick up for Afghans and, you know, delve more into, I mean, I've seen you work on actually Af history as well so what what like you know in that journey are there a any interesting stories um that you might have come across and b what motivates you to do um you know that work um in between when you say what motivates me on that particular work i think uh, you missed out some parts I, is in, i don't know if you missed out but i can't hear you i don't know what happened sorry oh, right were you able to repeat that again yeah of course i think it must be a connection issue sorry about that no but um i'm basically the question was um are there any interesting stories that you've come across during you know your sort of afghan sikh activism that you do and creating awareness and um you know what motivates you to do that work in the first place so um like every film that you see based about afghanistan is always about a person who's a terrorist and he belongs to Afghanistan. So this is the imagery which has left into people's mind throughout history. And every time you hear a person say Afghanistan, it's, you're, all, you're just generally assuming that this person is a terrorist. So I, came, I, wanna, I wanna reach out to people and I want to change their mindset of what people think of Afghanistan because Afghanistan is not just a place where terrorists are born it's or, or a place where you know um it's always about violence but once upon a time even during when my parents used to live uh, like uh still uh, when they used to live there and before the war happened afghanistan was much more like a city like london mm. there was freedom of speech there were people who would be able to go out looking the way they wanted to be um, there were, used to be fashion shows which used to happen in Afghanistan. Um, it was quite modern and that's something which Afghanistan used to be, but throughout the history has been changed and it has brainwashed people. So it kind of encouraged me to get out there and change people's perspective. Like myself, I have been in fashion for more than four years and every time I do something related to fashion, um, I'm... I'm always out there teaching them not just about Sikhism, but also about what an Afghan Sikh is. So that's why I believe more people need to get out onto the media and get out to the mainstream um, media as well, because people need to know more about who, what an Afghan is, because the way it's been portrayed, it's just negative itself. And I think we need to change that. What would your alternative narrative be? Then what would you say? What is an Afghan or what is an Afghan Sikh? How do you answer people when they ask you that question? So an Afghan Sikh is, although the religion is Afghan, uh, although the religion is Sikh, but the culture is an Afghan. Because like mm -hmm. myself, I listen to Afghan music and uh, I listen to, I dance to Afghan music. We even today, we sit at home, um, we eat on a distakhan. We mm -hmm. have our Thalanya, we have our um, Thalanyas around, like we always sit on the floor, we don't sit on the surface. It's something which has embedded us within the culture and it's 
this is something which we do throughout, not just in my family, but in all the families that we go to. My parents are speaking Farsi um, and Dari all the time to other people, um, like Pashto as well. When we went to Pakistan, my dad was speaking to Pashto to everyone. I was just like, there. I wish I could, I had, I wish I had that mm-hmm. chance to learn when I was back at home. So um, it's like we have that culture, we have that, we have that essence of Afghanistan within us, and. Even if you ask us to change it, we cannot change it because that's something that is not just in my my bloodstream, but everyone's bloodstream who have come from Afghanistan. And even the kids who have been brought up over here and who are born here, like for example, my little nephew, he still is Afghan because he has that bloodstream and he's following the same cultures and speaking the same language as well. So I think it's more to do with who you are and like it's to do with the way you are to become that person, I guess, and that personality. That's a very interesting perspective, I guess, because you still stay, no matter how different the culture or the upbringing is here in England, you know, um, you still do stay um, connected to your heritage, uh, which I think a lot of people in the diaspora have difficulty doing. Uh, I know personally, at least that is something that, you know, you come and you, <laughs> you it is, you, yeah, you know, I think... you, yeah, go on. No, 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 carry on, carry on. <laughs> I mean, it is, it's just something that I think a lot of people in the diaspora do struggle with because often what happens is you juxtapose the two identities that either you can be British or you can be, you know, uh, Afghan, Pakistani or any sort of, you know, South Asian or Middle Eastern. Um, and so it, it, it's, it, uh, and I mean, I, this is a personal thing where it's like I felt like, you know, sometimes it was a struggle between, oh, this is too British and not Pakistani enough, or this is too Pakistani and not British <laughs> enough, and you didn't know what to do where, between the two, right? And you just felt stuck. It's like, oh, um, and kind of forced to choose that at some points. But then as you grow older, I feel like you come to peace with it. Uh, I don't know if that was a similar experience for you. Uh, was, you know, what was it like? I guess so. Like, I think wherever you go to you always pick up things just like a language um mm. while i was making the hint call and i was speaking to um the uh, the photographer who also or uh, the docu uh, so he's a photographer he's a journalist who also went into afghanistan uh he went he did a documentary in afghanistan like in 2015. so his mm. name is Pritpal singh so I, while i was speaking to him about my film hint call and he told me something about language so he said where, whichever country that you go to you always end up having the lingual or the culture embedded and infused with with your own so again with our language the way we speak uh, regardless with hindi or with english we always have different linguals and different aesthetics added to it to make it to more personal to you and i think that's within every culture and everywhere you go so we can't really change that because it's something which we have which we have seen within other people and uh, it's something that you just grow into, I guess. And it's that personal connection, that personal, yeah, you have that personal connection with it. And yeah, regardless, like obviously, the more we stay true to our old yeah. culture, hold me in between, I, I mean, I do apologize. I think we're having some connection issues. Uh, hopefully, uh, Karanji will be back with us soon. And I would like to thank our viewers once again for watching. And he's back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I think no there was, uh, someone just called me in between. It's OK. Um, so I think like, yeah, whichever culture or whatever whichever city that you go to you end up infusing that culture within yours and it's something quite common which happens throughout wherever you go to within the western culture now even with the western uh, culture right now let's just say clothes they're infusing with the olden clothes mm. to make it a new perspective um with the language like slang comes in and also a lot of slang words are all like similar to the olden uh, old words so it's kind of infusing into the and trying to make a new thing so I think it happens and and I think it just creates that personal connection to you. 
Could you tell us more about Hintko? So Hintko, um, Hintko is a language which I speak and a lot of Hindu and Afghan Sikhs speak at home. So in Farsi, Ko means um, mountain. So back in the days in 907, when Muhammad Ghaznavi, when he went to conquer the India and when he came back on his way, he brought some Hindu people with him, uh, people from Afghan, uh, from uh, India. And the people that he brought with him were actually people who were living on the border of Afghanistan and uh, mm. India. So, um, and the language which they used to speak was called Ko, which means a mountain language. And okay. to make it into a more beautiful word, they they changed that word to Hind Ko. Uh, so in Farsi, Hind means India and Ko means mountain. Um, so the whole language became Hind Ko. And when those people, when they came into the city of Kabul and Jalalabad, um, they started to pick up languages within that province and they uh, started to add more uh, Farsi, Pashto, uh, Hindi, um, Urdu, Arabic, Persian. So a lot of languages kind of created Hindko and that is something which we speak at home and even within our culture. So we have a lot of different cultures kind of infused within our culture as well. So like, for example, weddings, uh, we have, we dance all though to Farsi songs and we do a lot of traditions in, uh, in, um, in Afghan traditions, but at the same time, we have uh, Indian culture in, infused with it as well. Um, and yeah, like, yeah, even like home, the food that we eat, it's again infused with, um, so we have our shak, we have mantu at home. Mm -hmm but the way they make it is quite different depending on the person like for example i'm jalabadi i'm from jalabad the way we create it might be different from a person who's probably from a garbled province so it's all based on where you come from and your background but it's similar like it's kind of has that same streamline throughout but that 20 percent would be a bit different depending on who you are that's very interesting. I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I'd heard of the language beforehand, but I didn't actually know that it, that was the history behind it. Uh, so no, thank you. For yeah, that. yeah, yeah. It's super no interesting. <laughs> even like, even for me, um, like, um, it was only about two to three years ago that I found out what language I used to speak because, like, um, if you watch the Hindko film, um, a lot of people don't actually know that we speak Hindko because the way we speak it, it has again like Punjabi, Hindi, Urdu, Farsi, Arabic essence to it so we always get confused what we're speaking mm. so if someone would ask me um, like before I knew that I was speaking Hindko I would probably say I was speaking Punjabi or I was speaking Hindi or I was speaking um, Farsi but it's kind of infused a bit different so it always kind of confused us but when I started to speak with more people uh, and started to speak with people who used to live in Afghanistan and have been living in Afghanistan for long for a very long time and um, they told me the history of this and that kind of made me more connected to the hometown and to the language itself because it kind of I kind of found my identity because you know if you don't even know what language you're speaking you're confused you don't know what, who you are because the main because that's my mother tongue but if you don't know what your mother tongue is you don't know who you are so yeah it can it kind of like made me find myself find myself so yeah that and that's what sorry sorry so you mentioned the film called hinko uh that's a film that you've made right okay and so yes, uh, i've made it um because I think there's a lag in between our connection. That's why you're getting the questions a bit later. Yeah, but my, uh, could you tell us more about the film in itself and what other sort of experiences you had while making the film? So I had the chance to speak with the journalist, um, Pritpal Singh, who went to mm -hmm. Afghanistan and made a film there. Um, so I had the chance to speak with him. I had the chance to speak to um, there's loads of people. So there's one called Dr. Amanath, who is the head of um, 
the Hindu temple. And there was one more person. I'll have to I'll have to find the name out because I I made that film quite a while ago, but um he was he's also a he's a writer, so he's also an author and um so he told me a bit more about the history of where the language comes from and then Dr Amarnath kind of told his experience of life and how the language it doesn't uh, language itself don't really have any um any um letters or any written alphabets. so you can actually so um that's why it's kind of hard to carry that language on and it probably will has to be carried out within different languages and when speaking to dr amarnath and the temple normally you would go to a temple uh, like a hindu temple you will probably mm. think that the writings that they will write in would be hindi but when i actually went there they were actually writing in uh, farsi okay So you know so you know when you um kind of do um a request to god and like right yeah that ending when you do that that was written in that was written in farsi and um i kind of it kind of like gave me a shock as well because i never assumed that that's something that they would have carried on and in the gurdwara um when we write the request at the gurdwara is written in punjabi and um but the lingual the way they say it is different but the way they write it it's different because uh the language like like i said and like uh dr ramanand said uh the language uh, that we speak we don't really have any alphabets to it and um yeah and they also spoke about their experience of how the prayers used to be different and the size of the prayers used to be different back at home compared to in uk uh because firstly they didn't have that space um and secondly it was very difficult um to even gather so many people at one place at a time because there was a lot of terrorism happening and um women weren't allowed to leave their home alone and if they were to leave home it would be very much they have to disguise themselves looking like someone else so there were a lot of things that that they had to go through back at home compared to UK and now over here there's a lot of freedom which is given to the people while they go to the gurdwara or they go to speak with people and trying to connect with them and speak to them about their heritage but um the kids and a lot of youngsters have westernized themselves so much that they kind of mm-hmm. have forgotten the roots so the whole film was more about their connection back at home and um how it has kind of reflected with the kids and the younger generation and how they need to kind of preserve that and hold it on to pass it on to the next generation and if we want to watch it how can we get access to that so if you just go on youtube and write hind koi will come up it was it's right. like the first, it will literally be on the top We'll link it as well into the bio of our YouTube video too, hopefully, because it does sound like a very interesting project. Uh, thank you for that. And um, so, I mean, thank another you. question that I would like to ask is: so you've mentioned that how it was difficult for Afghan Sikhs during the war period to, um, you know, uh, practice their religion back home. Are there any other sort of specific, maybe, stories that you've heard of what it was like to be Afghan Sikh? particularly during that time um you know either from uh, you know your parents or other members of the community that have migrated here uh cuz it's interesting I, you know and i would like to know more about that so before the war um the way people used to live was pretty much like how people used to live back in india like mm-hmm. you know how in uh, how in india and pakistan used to be like one little place and where people used to always go around each other's houses and there used to be like no issues going on whatsoever depend- regardless of what religion you are is the same thing that used to happen back in uh, afghanistan people used to sit together regardless of what religion they are uh, it used to be much more fun so how bisak used to be so you know how what a mela is like a, yeah, like, like a, a massive market Mm-hmm. Uh, like yeah basically a fair um so this is how they used to be back at home so this is the stories of my parents used to tell me mm-hmm. um so when 
a fair used to happen. Um, they used to go out. They used to play a lot of games. Um, so they used to live like in a, let's say, a massive house. So about two, three families you, you would live in a massive house. And um, so in, a, in in that one house, it would be your younger brother, your old, your younger brother, your older brother, because women always have to leave the house to go live with their in-laws. That's something like a tradition which has been going on for years. But um, for the family itself, so um, you would have your younger brother, your older brother, your grand, your granddad, um, your children's. Um, wives their grandchildren their children would all live in one house and that's how it used to be back at home during that period when they used to cook something for example they would cook a chicken or a rooster um like everyone would gather together to eat that houses used to be very close to each other so not like would be either a street away or literally next to each other and they used to have like a one tv um and they used to, they would have watched so my dad was telling me about the other day they 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 were going to they were watching rambo so rambo no. used to be a film that they used to watch back in uh, afghanistan and it would have been translated into dari and farsi they would they used to watch um uh, amitabh bachchan films back home back at home as well uh they used to be very small like very um small channels so either be like two or three channels that everyone would gather together to watch something so these like were the stories which my dad was telling me and um yeah they would and my dad um he also told me that he went into military so military was some uh, taskari that something uh, everyone would had to go through as well um so yeah obviously i'm not sure <laughs> about anything else but these are like this little small small anecdotes which my dad has told me and uh, after that times changed um people were le- leaving to move out to um either india or uh or to go to the uk or somewhere around the surroundings depending on how much money you would have and because we were quite poor then as well we didn't really have much a lot and when things started to get worse later on stage after the war uh then we had to sell a lot of things at back home and that's that's when like everyone started to move out because it's, it wasn't safe anymore even in the re- like even in the last year um the whole gudwara was bombed so mm. situations are getting worse year by year um even right now like nothing is safe to be fair so yeah. yeah that's like the tri- like the time scale of how things have happened i appreciate you uh sharing such a personal experience in particular uh you know it's uh it, it saddens you especially when you've got so much culture and so much heritage and just such a great connection with what you would have had as a life back home you know um i mean there might be a hint of romanticization there but even then it's just so it's it's a, they're good memories you know and uh, they're people's homes and their lives are being uprooted and so you know i do appreciate you sell uh, you telling us that story and um you know uh, your ex you've um, become you know very successful when you come here you know um, in terms of your modeling career and your I think uh, filming I'm still not successful <laughs> I mean do we ever get to a point where we do I hope like we all get in better but you have and you know you have show you've um featured in Vogue you featured you know you've uh, had the picture shown in very reputable like you know huge publications they're not my, any minor feats so I would cast that as successful um how you know how does that feel in kind of in like you know how what is that career like how is it to be an afghan sikh model especially in an industry which you know has a very particular view of what a person should look like yeah i think like um with modeling it's either a yes or a no um because not everyone can stand up stand in front of a camera and pose and literally um like the way the modeling industry is is either you look good or you look bad is that simple regardless of which background you are from regardless of it's only in the recent years when um because of the black lives matter a lot of other cultures 
have come to that spotlight and mm. now they're kind of shining and they're getting out there but about three years ago um the only place where i would probably speak more about myself would be in the in in the background of making so it wasn't really at the front uh, and um now because of black lives matter uh, a lot of a lot of um journalists have come out to speak with other cultures as well and how they feel about um the movement and mm -hmm. how has that benefited each and every individual um so like personally for me after black lives matter I w i've had that chance to speak with other people um like on twitter it had given me a chance to speak out and given me the opportunity to let other people know about more about my background and it's given a chance to a lot of other people as well to come out from that sh a nutshell and out and get out there and mm. it's the chance for them to shine now as well because like in the modeling industry it's it's like when you when you are at uh, when you are at a show or when you're on a magazine rep you're not representing yourself you're representing the designer you're representing their clothes but like because i have a turban and um it kind of gives me that push and kind of it's kind of helps me out there a bit more to kind of represent myself and a lot of a lot of um designers out there right now are doing doing that they're getting they they're getting people from like either small minority or who are either from a black background or a or a different background um they're trying to push themselves out there more as well and trying to reach and trying to teach other me, uh, other people about their culture so it's kind of it's moving it's moving but it was quite slow back about 2 3 years ago so yeah it's getting better so people are now getting becoming more aware of what goes around in the world well i hope i mean the diversity only increases because it's refreshing to see you know um that change and it's nice i it's something more relatable that you know i mean there's hijabis as yeah. well that i've seen. yeah they've started doing modeling exactly, too exactly yes even for nike for nike like the photographer which i worked with uh, alex mm -hmm. bay he's one of the uh, he, he is um the photographer who actually shot one of the sh one of the shoots for nike as well and uh Campbell Eddy uh, who who was my also my agent he's been out there representing the black models the diverse models out there as well so hats off to him for doing such an amazing job um because he's working with like um uh, Kylie Jenner he's working with such big brands right now and he had to go through a lot because i think me being with my old agency a uh, knee agency he was one of the first black agents out there representing models and now um there's also another agency called CL she um she is out there um so the agent uh, Benda so she's out there representing the diverse models as well so hats off to them trying to push other uh, other diversities out there and tr uh, and trying to push them to become better and also the photographers specifically targeting um uh diversity and also pushing them out there as well hats off to them and i think it's all creators which has to work together and try to push each other to come out and um represent other minorities so it's like i think if we were to move out if we were to uh, push out the minorities it wouldn't be just one person it would has to be done by all different creatives out there and they will have to uh push each other because because if they don't do it it's not going to happen it 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 clearly won't happen because the the industry is huge you know if a small person gets out there they only have that small following or the small um a uh, small market that they can work with but when you have different creatives going out there trying to create more stories about different people it will give the chance to other people to shine and get their stories heard either is that through Nike or Burberry or Calvin Klein or any other brand um it will be the creative directors and it has to be the whole team working to make that happen
Well, I'm glad to see that shift in diversity. And I do wish you all the best with that, uh, you know, uh, and I uh, wish you even more success than what you've already had. Thank you so much. Um, you know, okay. So uh, back to your filmmaking, which I find very interesting. Uh, are there any other projects? Are there any, you know, is there anything else that's going to, um, that's lined up, especially to do with like Afghanistan or Afghan identity in particular? Mm-hmm. Um, so recently I went to Pakistan, um, so I went there to create a film more about um, the Sikhism. So the, so obviously back in the days, Pakistan and India were one state. Uh, so I got the chance to go to Pakistan and be on the pilgrimage where Gunanak Dev was born, so I had the chance to go there. Uh, so that's one of the films which I created last year. Uh, this year I'm still working on, I'm, so I'm working on this project. Um, where I speak with a lot of other people uh, who have lived li- uh, lived their life before the war, because I think what's happening right now is, although we're focusing on the war, even though it's going on and um, we're trying to put people into the safety, but at the same time we're kind of losing our heritage and losing that time that used to be the good old days. So um, I'm just trying to get out there, speak with more people, try to capture the memories through um, through them and kind of preserving it for our upcoming um, generation. Because right now what's happening, um, everyone's moving away from their heritage. And when we speak with people who have lived their life, it kind of gives other people um, like, it gives them it gives them like that connection back at home and it kind of allows them to learn more about where people come from and trying to appreciate it more into their life mm-hmm. so and also trying to hold on to it and trying to pass it to the generation and kind of teaching them about what life used to be back at home because no one has experienced it and people won't experience that life again so it's just to give them a chance uh, to speak more about themselves, where they come from as well, and uh, passing it on to the next generation. Are there any interesting stories that you've come across that you could give us a glimpse of? Uh, so this is a project I've literally just started. So I've, right. I haven't had, I haven't really had the chance to speak to many people. I've only actually spoken to one person. And, um, Again, it's very hard when COVID's there because I can't really go out there and speak to them. Yeah. So um, it's very little. So it's quite hard right now, but I'm hoping once the COVID lifts, I can go out there and speak to them even more and uh, create more stories similar to Hindko. And uh, it will be a project which I'll be working on for like very, for for a good year or so. Yeah, well, please keep us updated. We would love to know, you know, how that project goes on because it does sound very interesting. Uh, you know, uh, telling stories is one thing that we definitely believe in. I mean, that's the whole point is of the whole platform in the first place is that where people get to have a voice and say over their own narrative, you know, rather than other people hijacking it for them. Uh, it, it keeps that sort of... Uh, I mean, people see it as being more subjective, but I see it, it as being more core to you know more um pure and pure or more i think it's closer to the roots if that you know yeah. i think that's a better term yeah, <laughs> because to- again like um what we've learned because i also got a degree in film what we say is everything that you see on screen doesn't have to be real and it's never that real because it's just because what you're doing you're actually narrowing down that time frame in mm. reality um and whatever you want to show on film you're choosing and picking what you what you're showing so you have so that's what film is you're it's that you're just trying to squeeze that time and frame and then publishing and you're only showing that specific direction you're not covering the whole 360 Mm. so the whole aim like what my aim is to kind of capture that whole 360 or what really happens and goes on back home well i wish you the best with that um now, this is the point in the discussion where I let our speakers basically take hold of the mic and, um, you know, basically where I stop asking questions and I let you, um, you know, say what you would like to say about Afghan identity or Afghanistan or, um, you know, anything surrounding the um, topic that, we're, um, that we've spoken about today. 
Um, so what I would probably say is like, whenever you look at an Afghan next time, just think what they had to go through to become what they are today. Every person has their own story. Um, every person has lived a different life. No life is the same. No experience is the same. And most importantly, um, whatever they've been through, the pain is in the same. So we all live in a different, we all live in a different world. Um, we all have experienced different things. So just be respectful next time you come across someone who is also an Afghan. And, and also um, there are different people who have lived in Afghanistan as well. For example, myself, um, I'm an Afghan, they're Hindu Afghan as well. Recently I've discovered there's Jewish Afghans as well who used right, to live yes. in Afghanistan. Yeah. And these people, um, they don't really want to show or share the story because they don't want to get judged. And sometimes it kind of, it's quite hurtful because um, you, because you want to know more about them, but because people judge them so much, they never want to come out. So never, so always try to, um, always try to speak with other people, speak with your elderly, speak with your grandparents, speak with your parents. Unfortunately, I don't really have any grandparents anymore. Um, well, I I, they died, they passed away when I was like five. Um, so every elderly that you speak with, just try to speak with them as much as you can, get to learn more about them, learn more about the experience. And yeah, just try to pass on your, uh, pass on your culture, culture, because um, it's, it's not going to be the same anymore. And especially with COVID, we're losing so many people in our lives. Just speak with them and try to capture the stories because that is something which is going to stay with you forever. Like people, people don't stay, the stories always stay. No, that's definitely true. I think stories definitely act as a legacy. Uh, so we do have a question that has come in. Uh, and it's saying, um, they're asking, uh, what do you think is the most unknown uh, fact about Afghan Sikhs? Unknown fact? Um, so we've been living there for nearly 400 years. Okay. In yeah, Afghanistan. That's... So yeah. Afghanistan, so... Um, how actually Sikhs evolved in Afghanistan was through Gurnanak Deji. So he's the first, um, you can say a prophet, but he's not really a prophet. He's the first guru um, okay. of, um, of the Sikhism. Um, and uh, he actually went to Afghanistan twice. And during his journey, he uh, left some followers behind. And throughout those followers, um, that's how the Afghan Sikhs evolved in Afghanistan. Right. Okay. That is, uh, no, I mean, I didn't know that. Uh, I mean, I would obviously heard of Guru Nanak, but I didn't like, you know, I didn't know that he'd actually visited Afghanistan and that's how Afghan Sikhs came about. Yeah, so he no, did. Very interesting. Yeah, what areas in twice. particular do you know? Um, I'm not too sure. Okay, I'm not right. too sure because the thing is, um, because Afghanistan uh, right now, the, the history and the stories of what used to be back at, back at home is not there anymore no, uh, because no. of the war and a lot of things going on. So we're losing a lot of history and this is the time we need to capture it before it all goes. Definitely true. No, and uh, I hope this, I mean, even this interview, I hope that does capture without pers oh, a certain perspective at least. It's been a very yeah, insightful hopefully. perspective. Uh, so I do really appreciate it. Uh, Karanji, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. And, uh, you know, it's been a very insightful interview. And I really do appreciate, again, uh, you know, for such an interesting perspective as, um, and contribution to the series. Uh, I would like to thank our audience for watching. Uh, please do join us again on Saturday, the 27th of February at 6 p.m. Um, Greenwich Mean Time, where we'll be in conversation with uh, the mayor, Zaf um, Zarifa Ghaffari. And I would like to thank everyone again on behalf of Identity International.